So my paper uh, is an overview of Canadian foreign investment policy since 1957. And rather than taking you through step by dreary step uh, Canadian policy, I thought it might be more interesting to uh, look at three key moments in the development of foreign investment policy. Three moments when the federal government decided that it should restrict the amount of foreign investment coming into Canada. Uh, the three moments are uh, the 1963 tax on the takeover of Canadian firms by foreigners uh, that was brought in by the Pearson government uh, that lasted about two weeks, I think. Uh, the 1973-74 creation of the Foreign Investment Review Agency and the decision of the Harper government in 2008 and 2010 to block the, the foreign takeover of two firms. Oh, I see. What have I done here? Sure. We've already taken pictures of those. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> I didn't need a PowerPoint. I didn't realize that. Uh, so I'll start with um, the, the takeover tax in 1963. And the context is vitally important. Uh, in the late 50s, there was an upsurge in anti-Americanism in Canada. Uh, a large part of this was a result oh, of McCarthyism in the United States, which uh, left Canada doubting the substance of American leadership in the Western world. Uh, it was brought to a head by the su suicide of the Canadian diplomat, Herbert Norman, uh, who was being hounded by a U.S. Senate committee. Much of this concern came to focus on foreign investment, uh, and it did so because of the Royal Commission on Canada's Economic Prospects, which held hearings across the country and issued a couple of influential reports, uh, the commission chaired by Walter Gordon. There was not, despite the, the debate, there was not a consensus in Canada against foreign investment. Uh, and any concern that there might have been about foreign investment had dissipated by 1963, when Walter Gordon became the Minister of Finance in the government of Lester Pearson. Gordon remained concerned, alarmed about foreign investment, uh, but very few of his colleagues in the cabinet were, and none of the senior officials in Ottawa were. Nonetheless, in his first budget, uh, Gordon introduced a 30% tax on the takeover of Canadian firms by foreign buyers. In Gordon's view, quote, non-resident takeovers of established companies rarely confer any benefit on the Canadian economy. Obviously, he hadn't seen your slides. Uh, the proposal was greeted with an uproar in the media and from the financial sector in Canada. And with Lester Pearson's government in a precarious minority situation, uh, Gordon was forced to withdraw the tax. He said that he was withdrawing it because there were some administrative problems that needed to be worked out. Uh, but in reality, uh, the tax was dead, and he never reintroduced it. It's quite clear uh, that the tax was ill-considered. Uh, Gordon had never convinced uh, the public or even his cabinet colleagues of the value of his proposal. And in fact, it was never clear precisely what problem the tax was intended to solve or how it would solve it. Uh, my second moment is the creation of the Foreign Investment Review Agency in 1973-74. And again, the context is vitally important. Uh, when the Trudeau government came to, to power in 1968, there was again an upsurge in, in anti-Americanism in Canada. Uh, in this case, it was fed by the American War in Vietnam, which was broadcast into uh, Canadian living rooms every night, and by racial conflict in the United States, riots in American cities, uh, whites attacking peaceful black protesters, and so on. American investment in Canada at the same time was becoming increasingly unpopular. Now, the government did virtually nothing for the first couple of years of its mandate, from 68 to 70. But then Cabinet had agreed that Herb Gray, who was then the Minister Without Portfolio, uh, should establish a working group of officials, and they should create a policy on foreign investment. Gray submitted his report to Cabinet in 1971, and it called for the creation of an agency to screen incoming foreign investment. Pierre Trudeau himself was highly skeptical. Uh, in 1968, when he, he was seeking his party's leadership, he said uh, nationalism was, quote, an excessive doctrine that tends to work against the best interests of a trading nation like, Can like Canada. Uh, he told Alistair Gillespie, who was the minister responsible for the legislation, quote, you know, I'm not a nationalist, and this is a form of nationalism which I find suspect. 
According to Gillespie, Trudeau came around sometime in 1971. And he came around for two reasons. One, uh, there was a lot of pressure within the Liberal caucus uh, to move in this direction. Uh, and the government was heading into an election. It had a year left before it would uh, seek to renew its mandate. Uh, and it wasn't doing all that well in, in the polls, particularly in Ontario, where the nationalist issue was strongest. In February of 1972, the Gallup poll that showed that 69% of Canadians were in favour of a screening agency, only 15% were against. Gillespie, Herb Gray and others favoured the creation of FIRA, uh, but there was also a very strong component in Cabinet that was against. Uh, Foreign Minister Mitchell Sharp, uh, Jean Marchand, who was the Minister of Regional and Economic Expansion, uh, Otto Lang, the Minister of Manpower, Treasury Board President Bud Drury, Minister of Public Works Arthur Lang. Finally, in May 1972, uh, the government introduced the legislation to create FIRA. Uh, so this is four years that it's been in power, two years after it created a working group to draft the legislation. Uh, but the bill was not passed by the time the government called an election that fall. On election day, the Trudeau government was reduced to a minority and suddenly became dependent on support from the NDP, which strongly pushed for the creation of a screening agency. The government responded by reintroducing its legislation from before the election, only giving more power to the agency. Originally, the agency was only going to screen the takeover of Canadian firms. Now it was going to screen any new investment in Canada. So the setting up of a new firm had to receive permission from the screening agency. FIRA came into existence in early 1974, and the screening process operated shrouded in mystery for the next decade. But after the government regained its majority in the 74 election, it lost interest in FIRA. In 1976, Jean Chrétien became the minister responsible for the agency and publicly distanced himself from economic nationalism. He said that economic nationalists were people who, quote, often used the flag for their own interests. He said there was a lot of places in Canada where people don't give a damn who owns what. I wish I could do the accent. A lot of people don't give a damn who owns what. They want a job. You can imagine the words coming out of the man's mouth. Much has been made about Brian Mulroney's decision when he came to power in 1984 to replace the Foreign Investment Review Agency with Investment Canada, Investment Canada being an organization dedicated to encouraging foreign investment in Canada. But what's very seldom mentioned is that the idea for Investment Canada actually came from the Trudeau government. This was an idea of being batted around in, in, uh, in uh, liberal circles in Ottawa in the late Trudeau years. In short, public opinion and the political necessity of placating the NDP pushed the government to create FIRA. Trudeau never accepted that it was economically necessary or even desirable. With a renewed majority, the government slowly backed away. So that brings me to the third moment, and the third moment is actually two sub-moments, if you will. One in 2008, when the government rejected the takeover of the, uh, the aviation technology branch of McDonnell Detweiler, and one in 2010, when the government uh, rejected the take takeover of Potash Corporation. Uh, investment Canada was supposed to encourage the foreign investment in Canada, uh, but it maintained a screening power. It continued to uh, have the power to screen foreign investment in certain occasions. In 2007-2008, there was a widespread discussion in Canada about the hollowing out of, of the Canadian corporate sector, uh, largely the result of several high, uh, highly prominent takeovers of Canadian firms. Uh, the concern was that foreign owned, when, when a Canadian firm was bought out by foreigners, that the functions of the head office would be transferred abroad. Uh, in fact, the data suggests that Canada was experiencing a net increase in head offices, but uh, data has never affected political debate in Canada. Alliant Tech Systems proposed to take over McDonnell Detweiler's Space Technology Division. Uh, that's the division that built the Canada Arm and the Radar Sat 2 satellite. Uh, selling the division to an American company would have allowed it to bid on U.S. defense contracts. The media covered the deal extensively, and opposition grew. Conservative MPs began criticizing the deal in public. Critics compared the takeover of McDonnell Detweiler to the Diefenbaker government's uh, 1959 decision to scrap the Avro Arrow. 
Critics also asked whether the U.S. government could use satellite data from Radarsat 2 when contesting Canada's claims to the Arctic. Uh, and this at a time when the Harper government put a high, um, high, a fair bit of attention on the issue of Canadian sovereignty in the Arctic. Uh, ultimately, the government blocked the deal, the first time in the 23-year history of the Investment Canada Act that the government had used the legislation to block a foreign takeover. Uh, again, in 2010, uh, the government rejected a foreign takeover, this time when an Australian company, BH BHP Billiton, uh, had a bid to buy Potash Corporation. Initially, Harper had said that it didn't matter who owned Potash. In fact, he pointed out that Potash was already 51% foreign-owned. Uh, but the sale was opposed by the Saskatchewan government and a large number of influential Westerners. Saskatchewan Premier Brad Wall said that the company was, quote, a Canadian icon and that Potash was, quote, a strategic resource. Uh, Ottawa, he said, had to stand up for Canada. Harper changed his stance and the government scuttled the deal. In neither case, neither McDonald, Getweiler, nor Potash did the government clearly explain its reasons. But it was evident that the decision was political, not economic. A minority government with an election always imminent could not take risks. So my conclusion. In all three cases, policy was made by a minority government with its eye focused almost obsessively on public opinion. In no case was the Prime Minister fully convinced that limits on foreign investment were necessary. And in no case did the government maintain a long-term policy commitment to limiting foreign investment. The result was murky and unpredictable policy. Objectives were political, not economic. Policy was based on conjecture rather than evidence. Legislation was not enforced in a transparent way. And policy changed with the political winds. Thank you.